for Obama. And he seems to have a lot of connections. And if you saw the, the interview that he had with uh, Stephen Colbert, it was a puff piece interview, but he did a great job coming across. Of course, we know that uh, he's prone to gaffes, but that doesn't seem to be a problem this time around. People are looking for someone that they think is authentic. And if you misspeak, that simply makes you sound authentic to them, no matter how well connected with the establishment you are. Now, on the other side of things, even though there are people still in the Democrat Party who are still trying to push Clinton, and I believe that there's others who are trying to drive her out, if they can get her down with this email scandal, that would be something where they could take her down without getting themselves involved. But with her financial backers, we see a couple of days ago on September 19th, USA Today reported that big businesses are abandoning the Clinton Global Initiative. That sounds pretty sinister, doesn't it? The Clinton Global Initiative. Yeah, it's actually, actually is sinister. <laughs> it actually is a, a, a globalist plot. It is a nonprofit arm of the Clinton dynasty, USA Today says. But some of the investment companies, some of the large corporations, the mega corporations that have pulled out of donating uh, to that right now are Samsung, ExxonMobil, Deutsche Bank, HSBC, Price Waterhouse Coopers, big counting firm Hewlett Packard. Monsanto and Dow. So some of these high profile corporations, as they say, might not be the only supporters backing away from association with the Clinton family charitable arm. In 2014, eight national leaders, kings, presidents, prime ministers appeared on the program for the Clinton Global Initiative annual meeting. Now this year, only two leaders, one from Colombia and another one from Liberia are on the program. How's that for a drop and your self-esteem when you've just got uh, two leaders, one from Colombia and the other one from Liberia. Most Americans probably couldn't find those two countries on the map. Uh, but nevertheless, I think that's going to move in the way of Joe Biden. Now, on the other side, we've got Carly Fiorina moving up rapidly in the polls. And I want to take a look at that and, and also uh, what Donald Trump uh, says he's going to spend $100 million to win the presidency. Uh, that used to be a lot of money. That used to be the entire amount of money going back to the early, early days of the American Republic. You know, like 2000 and 2000, uh, George Bush spent $100 million and Al Gore accused him of trying to buy the election. Remember that? Uh, well, Donald Trump could spend that on his own, but that's going to be pretty small compared to the amount of money that people are raising and spending today, hundreds of millions. I think uh, one of the, I think it was the last time that Obama ran, I'm just Pulling from memory here, I think it was something like $600 million or more that Obama had. Uh, because, you know, those big corporations like we just listed, Monsanto, Hewlett-Packard, uh, Deutsche Bank, HSBC, they're the ones getting involved in this. And they have changed the way that uh, corporations can in get involved. They've also changed the party rules, however. That's a report from the New York Times. They say party rules meant to streamline the race may backfire for the GOP. You remember that the GOP was very, very frightened about the rise of Ron Paul. They wanted to make sure that was never going to happen again, that they were never going to have to embarrass themselves by publicly rigging the primaries and the caucuses as we saw them do and caught them red-handed. So what they did was they tried to rush things up, and they're saying that this may actually backfire on the GOP establishment. It may actually make it easier for Donald Trump to get the nomination. And certainly he's saying things and saying them in a way that the other candidates in the GOP fear to tread. When we come back, though, we're going to take a look at the rising candidate of the week, Carly Fiorina. Stay with us. We have a breaking news article that was just handed to me by Kit Daniels. Media promotes pedophile rights. Not long after same-sex marriage ruling, leftists are now demanding rights for, for pedophiles. They say the leftist media is promoting this as the next social justice movement. Salon.com published an op-ed by a self-described pedophile asking Americans to, quote, learn to accept pedophiles and to be, quote, understanding and supportive of their sexual orientation. This is now a sexual orientation. Preying on young children. What do we expect when we despise the idea anymore in America of consent? We despise the idea of consent when it comes to what's in your food. What's in your medicine? What medicines you will take? What medicines you'll be injected with? We're not informed and they don't want our consent when it comes to trade treaties that are going to remake our economy, remake our government. 
they don't want our consent. And so why would they care about the consent of children? Because you can't give consent as a child. That's what we've always understood. We've always understood that children are especially vulnerable because children are easily manipulated. And so we have always had an age of consent that has varied back and forth uh, over the years, over different societies. But we all understand children need to be protected because they are not able to give consent. That's why pedophilia is wrong. Let me make that very simple for you. It's one of the key reasons why it's wrong. You can never have mutual consent by definition. This is another example of our government selling this evil because of a brave new world philosophy. It's exactly like Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. They kept the vast majority of the population under control by keeping them in this hedonistic stupor. That's precisely what's going on in our society. People go back and forth. We've, had, we've talked about this before. Do we live in a 1984 world? Do we live in an Aldous Huxley's uh, Brave New World? Well, actually, you live in both. The vast majority of the people, if they can be controlled, they go for them first with a brave new world dumbing down. If somehow that idiocracy that you are fed in school, fed in the media, fed by the politicians, if that doesn't work, then what they give you is the full Orwellian 1984 treatment. Total surveillance to identify those who are going to stand out from amongst the dumbed down idiocracies. That's the whole idea behind activity-based intelligence, human domain analytics, the geospatial intelligence. It's predictive. They want to see who pops up. It's just that simple. You know, there's an old saying in Japan in terms of making conformity. Uh, we had some friends who were Japanese, and they said, and I, I can't remember the exact expression, but it's essentially uh, the head that pops up gets hammered down. There is a massive effort, very successful in Japanese society, to make everybody conform to society's norms, the things that are dictated to them, the cultural norms, how you should, what, what it means to be successful, that type of thing. And if you deviate from that, you are hammered down. We are going to be living in a high-tech society, a technocracy, as the big new Brzezinski looked at, that's going to monitor everything that we do. He predicted this a long time ago. That's how they picked him to lead the Trilateral Commission. They were very, very happy with the book that he wrote in 1970, talking about the technocracy, talking about merging uh, three global blocks in North America, Asia, and Europe, those being the stepping stones to a one-world government. This has been planned for a very long time. This has always been the dream of tyrants and dictators. And the way they do it, even going back to Plato's Republic, make sure you destroy the family. Make sure you know that, that, that nobody identifies with a mother and a father or with a family, but only with the state. That was Plato's ideal. Make sure that they don't know, that it's not possible for them to even know who their parents are. So the only parent is the state. And, of course, that is precisely what happened in Huxley's world. This is what they're selling us now. Listen to this quote. This is also from the pedophile who's selling this. He says, in essence, your brain knows what it likes, and it isn't going to take no for an answer, he said in his op-ed. For that reason, the nature or nurture question with respect to sexual preference is ultimately irrelevant. It all becomes all hard work, hardwired soon enough until it's all you know, and it's self-reinforcing no matter how much you wish to dig it out. Many of us look at that and say, yes, unfortunately, this man is possessed in many different aspects of that word with his sexuality. This is the way it's going to be sold to us. First, it's going to be as he's putting it to us. Then we're going to see pedophilia represented in a funny little way. We're already seeing that in many different ways interjected into movies. You'll have some sympathetic characters that will come along and then they will demand that it is a civil right. Stay with us. We're going to be right back. We're going to talk about ISIS and little green men that the Russians are finally ex admitting exist. Not we the kind you think march. of, though. I want to go to a caller who's been waiting a long time, uh, Scott, in Washington. Before I do, I just want to let you know that we do have Survival Shield X2 back in stock. We ran out of it during the money bomb last week, but we got an emergency supply in. So that is now available at our store, this ultra-pure, ultra-powerful iodine. Available to you at the most affordable prices out there. The elite know that you need iodine to live. That's why they took it out of the food supply. 
And it's why they're buying up iodine supplies around the world. We do have it back in stock. Let me read you a couple of the uh, reviews that are on InfoWarsLife.com. This one is from Barrett in Burlington, Wisconsin. He says, super easy to use. Three drops on the tongue in the morning. Tastes great. If I don't have time to make coffee, at least I know this takes five seconds and I'll get the energy I need to get going. Buy this product, he said. Another one. Logan in Phoenix, Arizona. I take six drops daily, first thing in the morning, and the results are terrific. Read the reviews. Read about iodine. Read why it is an essential nutrient that you need. And you can find all of that as well as buy it. It's now in stock at InfoWarsLife.com. Let's go to Scott in Washington. Scott, thank you for hanging on for so long. You wanted to talk about immigration, it says. Yeah, I did. I do want to talk about immigration, but I just wanted to mention real quick because you were talking about the stuff that was going on in the uh, primaries as far as on the Democratic side about them putting up Joe Biden in place of Hillary. And I think the whole thing with that is, is that Bernie Sanders was meant to be the attention getter to get the base riled up and to turn it over to whoever yeah. The front runner over there is going to be, because Bernie Sanders is a shield, no doubt he was paid off by them to do that. And whether it's going to be Hillary or Joe or something, the fact that they're doing all that stuff behind the scenes, they haven't even had a debate or something, that tells you mm -hmm. a lot right mm -hmm. there about how secretive they are. But, oh, it's totally controlled. Yeah. I mean, we saw that with the Republican primaries, as I mentioned, with uh, Ron Paul when he was running, how corrupt the GOP was. These guys don't even pretend to have debates. I mean, that's, that's how controlled yeah. the Democrat uh, Party is. And, and it really does underscore why we need to have a more, much, much, much more open electoral system. It's one of the many things uh, that makes the electoral system completely rigged, completely dysfunctional. And that is even just ballot access or access to the debates. We've seen that happen over and over again. But you had a comment about uh, immigration. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. What inspired me to call in was basically... Uh when uh, Jesse Ventura was on, and I'm not picking on him just per se, but I noticed with that ilk and that uh, whole thing about all oh, your races, if you don't accept the uh, borders and stuff, and typically it comes from these people who do not have dogs in the fight themselves. They're off secluded, uh, you know, in their own little areas and stuff like that. They, uh, they're not amongst you know, in these areas where a lot of these immigrants come into or these illegals come into, where there's a lot of this infighting going on in the inner cities and stuff like that, they put up these arguments about, oh, well, but they're coming over here for a better life. Do you want to just punish them? Well, I would say to them, okay, was well, it fair to those who were over here who tried to go through the illegal hoops to uh, get here legally and stuff like that? Is it fair to discard them? I would say, you know what, hey. Uh, if you're all accepting about uh, having people come over here illegally and stuff, put up or shut up. Invite some of them into your house. You know, give of yourself. Yeah, we you heard know, uh, Nancy Pelosi say that. She said, uh, all these people coming, we just have... Uh we have one community that just happens to have a border running through it. I wish I could adopt them all. But she didn't, did she? She didn't adopt a single one. Precisely what you're talking about. Look, Scott, what it, what it boils down to is just look at the education standpoint of this. We have an explosion in our schools, and it's not just providing an education for them. All these children, and they're not just all coming from uh, Central and South America, they're coming from all over the world. 40, 50, 60 different languages some school districts are having to teach these children in because we have to give them a customized education. We don't want them to assimilate. Heaven forbid they would assimilate. Heaven forbid we would have a melting pot. That would not serve the motives of the controlling elite whatsoever. It's all about divide and conquer, but it's also a practical aspect. We will literally be driven out of our homes just to pay for the education aspect of it, even if it's not any other welfare aspects. Already, education budgets are out of control in most cases. That's where the massive property taxes that everyone has to pay are coming from. And if you're not paying the property taxes because you live in a rented uh, apartment, you are still paying it. You just don't see it itemized. You don't understand what a huge part of your living expenses that is. So are we going to wind up being homeless uh, in our own country? And that's one of the aspects of it. I hear people like Jesse Ventura say, look, we have to understand that uh, unless we're Native Americans or Indians, as uh, Russell Means preferred the term Indian, unless we're Indians, uh, we're all immigrants here. Well, you know what? I don't support the idea that we stole land from the Indians. I don't support the idea that we 
tore up the treaties that we made with the Indians. I think that's horrendous. I think Russell Means was right when he said the federal government has destroyed every treaty it's made with the Indians. The treaty they made with you, white man, is the Constitution.